This is the second part of my video on building a 3D printed compressed air turbine. In my first video, I created a turbine with a scooped rotor that could generate about 9 watts at 50 psi, and then improved that number to 16 watts with a two-dimensional flow design. In this video, I'm going to investigate some ways to improve even more by adjusting rotor and casing geometry, and I'll also take a look at multiple stages. To have some consistent metric for comparison, I designed all my test rotors to be an 80 millimeter diameter with radius notches set at a known angle to the horizontal. So each design had a code number that reflected that pattern. The particular rotor you see here was the one from my previous video, which had seven notches with a five millimeter radius. Its power curve is shown on this graph in red, topping out at 16.4 watts at 9700 RPM. I suspected the number of notches or blades probably had a significant effect on power, so for the next test I printed a design with 10 notches. Here the notches are cut at a 20 degree angle relative to the tangent line to allow them to fit. I disassembled the turbine and installed the 10 bladed rotor. Using almost all the same parts between tests is convenient, but it also helps ensure consistency for comparing results. Oh yeah, before I forget, I replaced that crappy corroded after cooler from my previous video with an air-cooled one I built using a transmission oil radiator and a fan. I didn't realize this before, but a moisture trap is required to catch the condensation, otherwise you'll still have water get into your tank, but it'll just be blown in as liquid droplets instead of vapor. But I digress. Let's see how my 10-bladed rotor compares to the 7-bladed one. The test itself isn't really much to look at, just a spinny thing and some incredibly loud noises. Let's see how it did. So there's my result again in red from the previous video, and in green is the 10 bladed rotor peaking at about 19.4 watts. That's about an 18% improvement. So naturally I figured it only made sense to test with even more blades, so the next one I did was a 14 bladed design with a 60 degree notch angle. The notch angles get steeper as the blade count increases because you start having to cut them radially instead of at a tangent. 14 was about as many as I could fit without moving to a smaller notch radius. So I repeated the same routine of disassembling the turbine and replacing the rotor and then ran another test. Again, not much to watch because thankfully nothing exploded from centrifugal force. Okay, so here's our results from previously with the 10 bladed rotor in green, and here's the results from the 14 bladed rotor in purple. This one peaked at 20.1 watts, just under 13,000 RPM. That's just under 4% improvement against the 10 bladed rotor, but more than double the output of the first rotor in my previous video. There wasn't really any room to add more blades using my current notch radius, so the next thing I tried was putting fences on the side of the rotor. My thinking here was that these might delay the leakage of the air around the sides of the rotor, thereby allowing a little more time to extract energy from the pockets of high pressure air inside the notches. Here's what it looked like after printing. This geometry was slightly more complicated because it required a separate cap to be glued on to complete the fence. So let's throw that into the turbine and see how it does. I was a little disappointed to find that the addition of fences caused a slight drop in maximum power, topping out at 19 watts. However, one interesting thing I did notice was that the maximum RPM went up by about 5%. The only thing I can figure is that the power drop was due to having a narrower area for the high pressure pockets to act on, so I tried a completely different approach and widened the rotor from 20mm to 40mm. Theoretically this should give me a bigger area to hit and give the high pressure air a little more dwell time before it leaks around the sides through the gaps. So let's try that out and see how it works. The 40mm wide version had an even lower performance than the fenced version, topping out at 18.9 watts. Frankly, I was kind of surprised by this result because I expected at least a marginal improvement over the 20 millimeter wide rotor, but I guess real life is more complicated than theory. Without tighter tolerances between the turbine rotor and casing wall, I didn't think I was going to see any huge improvements if I kept tinkering with rotor geometry, so I shifted my focus to the casing design. More specifically, I was interested in the relative positioning of the inlet and the outlet. Was it better to have air shoot right through in a straight line or curve around 180 degrees? Maybe the answer was somewhere in the middle, so I tested casings with 0, 90, and 180 degrees between the inlet and outlet. My money is on the 180 degree configuration, which is why I'm actually already using it. My theory is that it should result in the longest dwell time for high pressure air. However, as we just saw, my guess with the wider rotor turned out to be wrong, so I wanted to test this hunch to verify. Here's the results of that test. This time my intuition did turn out to be right, and the inlet to outlet angle actually did make a pretty big difference. 
The straight flow casing topped out at 16.5 watts, which is almost 20% less than the 180 degree flow at 20.1 watts. The 90 degree flow casing wasn't much better, topping out at just 17.3 watts. Without spending a bunch of time fine tuning the turbine tolerances, I think the 180 degree flow case was as good as I could do for the moment, so the next thing I wanted to look at was multiple stages. I calculated the pressure and flow rate coming off my compressor and determined that even with my best case configuration, I was only getting about 8% efficiency. Good turbines can be as much as 70 or even 80% efficient, but what they all have in common is that they've got multiple stages. This is because it's not possible to extract all the energy out of a high pressure gas in one stage. According to this formula for isentropic flow, beyond a certain pressure ratio, a gas will go supersonic. Supersonic flow inside a turbine would cause an enormous efficiency loss and probably also result in turbulence and vibrations that would destroy it. So the pressure drop has to be divided up into several stages. So the absolute maximum ratio per stage is about 1.9 for air, but in most turbines you'll find ratios between, say, 1.3 and 1.6, depending on how they're designed. That means for each stage, you're dividing the pressure by, let's say, 1.6, just for example, so you'll get an exponential drop in pressure as you progress through the turbine, which will have a corresponding drop in density that the rotor blades will have to be bigger to compensate for. That's why gas or steam turbines on ships, power plants, etc. tend to have an exponentially increasing size along the axis. In contrast to a surface-based system, an aircraft jet engine will have fewer stages because each stage extracts less energy than the one before it, and that little bit of extra energy isn't worth the weight and size it would add to the engine. I can't measure the output pressure directly, but knowing the flow energy and output power, I approximated the pressure ratio in my turbine to be about 1.12. That means there's a ton of energy that's just being thrown out. With my input pressure, in theory I could have as many as 8 stages before the absolute pressure became too low to choke the flow in the inlet nozzle. If all that energy was harnessed, I could potentially raise my efficiency from 8% to as much as 45%. Still terrible by industrial standards, but amazing for a 3D printed homemade turbine. But before I get too far ahead of myself, I'll just try two stages. This will consist of two of my original turbines back to back with an extra tube piping the first stage output into the second stage inlet. I was having some trouble with vibrations caused by the magnet rotor on my eddy current brake, so I built a traditional friction brake for the torque measurement instead. I built a much smaller magnet rotor that's only for the oscilloscope measurement of rotation frequency. To my surprise, the two-stage turbine only had about 75% the performance of the single stage, coming in at 15.2 watts. The turbine casing and the shaft bearings were leaking a noticeable amount of air while I was conducting the test. The stagnation pressure of the first stage wasn't being recaptured and sent into the second stage, it was just taking a higher resistance path out of the first stage casing, causing an overall loss. I'm still very confident that adding stages will dramatically increase the output power, but I need to figure out a better way to seal the shafts and turbine casings. By this point, I had accumulated a mountain of printed parts, so I figured it might be time to give the printer a break. One potentially major improvement that I didn't cover in this video is the use of a converging-diverging nozzle, just like what a rocket has. Currently, my inlet nozzle is just a simple 1 16th hole that chokes the flow so that output is sonic. However, this leaves a lot of static pressure energy that doesn't get converted to kinetic energy, and as we saw earlier, most of my static pressure just leaks away because of loose tolerances and sealing problems. If the inlet nozzle was designed in such a way that it necked down to a point and then expanded, the flow would become supersonic and with the right geometry, kinetic energy could be maximized. 
At 50 psi, the flow could be accelerated to about Mach 1.6 in a diverging section. So assuming the blades were capturing the same percentage of momentum from the flow, that could increase efficiency from 8% to almost 13%. Currently, the only thing stopping me from doing this is that I don't have drill bits or mills to machine that type of geometry at the tiny size required to maintain continuous flow with my compressor. So all of this begs the question, why even bother building a compressed air turbine? I mean, I can get a brushless DC motor that has 10 times as much power for the size and even spins faster, and if I was dead set on using pneumatic tools, I could always just repurpose an air drill, which has a much more efficient motor because it's essentially a turbine and positive displacement device. But my real motive here is to eventually make a miniature Brayton cycle air liquefaction plant to create liquid oxygen and nitrogen. Years ago, if you wanted to get into cryogenics, it used to be relatively easy to find Sterling coolers on eBay or through various surplus suppliers for a couple hundred bucks but the supply seems to have dried up, leaving me with few options. A Brayton refrigeration cycle seems to be the most efficient alternative if I can't get my hands on a Stirling cooler, and theoretically, cryo temperatures should be achievable with a consumer-grade compressor, but the trick here is having an efficient enough turbine to remove energy from the air to cool it. The reason I can't use a typical pneumatic drill rotor for the turbine is because the sliding vanes would crack and snap off at cryogenic temperatures. But in theory, a turbine running on dry bearings should be able to stand up to the cold, even if it's made out of PLA. Overall, I'm pretty happy with these results, and this project provided me with a lot of insight into turbine design. There's definitely going to be a part three of this video at some point, but in the meantime, I have some other projects I want to finish. Thanks for watching.